I would like to uh, introduce our guest speaker tonight. So if you've ever spent a night under the stars watching uh, for meteors and you've seen something unusual, you'll want to listen to this talk by uh, Dr. Peter Yenikson. He is an expert on meteor showers and author of Meteor Showers and Their Parent Comets, the definitive book on over 700 known meteor showers. Uh, Peter currently runs the NASA-sponsored CAMS for All Sky Meteor Surveillance, CAMS project, which uh, if you've been on our uh, Astro list, you've seen a lot of talk going back and forth uh, around that. Uh, Walt Cooney is uh, very active in that uh, project. Uh, but that project uses a global network of security cameras, which are used to track meteors with sufficient data to confirm their orbits. The project aims to verify some of the 300 plus meteor showers in the IAU working list that need confirmation. Uh, Peter, Peter is a meteor storm chaser who likes to watch meteor showers when they're at their most spectacular, high above clouds in an airplane. I've, I've never done that. <laughs> uh, his NASA-sponsored multi-instrument aircraft campaigns have brought uh, teams of researchers to Japan, Israel, and Spain to study the 1998 to 2002 Leonid meteor, sh meteor showers. Uh, in 2007 and 2008, he studied from the air an encounter with the dust of long period comet C-1911 and one Kais and the quadranted showers. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest tonight, Dr. Peter Yenison. Uh, Dr. P uh, Dr. Yenison, thank you very much for joining us. And I will stop my share here so you can present uh, what it is you need. So I'd like to uh, thank all the new members of the club as, uh, you know, one of you, uh, maybe the, the future observer who uh, discovers something really interesting in the sky. Um, it really can happen. Um, there is a lot of opportunities uh, for observing these days with, uh, you know, the great telescopes that are out there for amateur astronomers. And um, all of you have access to a lot of public data that uh, data mining can uh, really result in uh, very cool discoveries. Um, so, uh, you know, one of you, one of you might, uh, might bring that to the table at some point. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, Walt Cooney for inviting me to talk. Uh, Walt and I have been talking for a while now with a really cool project that is happening around the Houston area, uh, tracking uh, meteors and meteor showers. And uh, hopefully that, um, leads to more really interesting uh, discoveries, one of which already has happened during the last uh, Perseids. So uh, I, I was thinking about what to talk about and um, I decided that I was gonna emphasize a little bit the CAMS project and um, what we're trying to do with, these, with the cameras. Um, I wanted to start with sort of introducing myself. I, I was an amateur myself, uh, that's where my roots are, in the Dutch Media Society. Uh, when I was a first year student in astronomy, um, I became a member and uh, for many years uh, observed the skies visually, uh, tracking the parts of meteors on star charts. You have these little, you would lay down in a reclining line, lawn chair and I looked up at the sky for hours on end at night um, and whenever we saw a shooting star, we would plot the path uh, on, the, on the star chart. And um, when we were done, we would try and see if uh, there were any new showers there, any uh, unknown uh, uh, meteor showers to, uh, in the sky. And, uh, you know, we did that for many years and saw interesting things. And gradually uh, we also deployed um, photographic cameras as a, as a tool. In those days, you still had to develop the film and, you know, it was all very cumbersome. Uh, after uh, 20 years, we had like 300 or 400 meters uh, multi-station. But this was a project uh, that was run by Hans Bethlehem, who was the, who was leading the Dutch Media Society. He was also an amateur astronomer. And, uh, and it was uh, him who really sort of inspired me to, uh, to pursue this field. And so later uh, I got an opportunity to do this professionally and uh, really sort of dig into, you know, what, um, what are our meteor showers? Where did they come from? What are the dynamical mechanisms behind these streams? Uh, this is a comet hardly too uh, active, a lot of dust coming from it. And uh, when a comet goes around the sun, uh, it, uh, it creates this cloud of debris around it and some particles make a wider orbit. Uh, you know, get a little bit of extra speed and, and take longer to come back. Some particles take a, 
shorter orbit and um, and come back earlier. And so after one orbit, you already see this uh, this cloud of debris being spread around a significant part of the orbit. And then meteor streamer looks sort of like this. That's the stream of Comet Enki. And you can actually see these streams in space and infrared observations in the past uh, as thin trails of uh, of scattered sunlight. Um, we were talking about, uh, you know, that it would be uh, an incredible storm if Earth would actually cross these dust trails. But um, and so uh, people thought it was unlikely at the time that this would happen. But in fact, uh, I knew from our observations that uh, the the duration of a shower that we would see if we go, would go through this would be um, about right for uh, for a past meteor storm. And turns out that uh, this mechanism is basically what gives us our meteor uh, meteor storms. And so that sort of got us going. Um, my first project I did, this was uh, my, uh, also my first project for NASA, but with support of all the Dutch Meteor Society uh, friends. Uh, we traveled uh, the world to places to see um, meteor outbursts, which is basically a meteor shower that, that lasts only an hour or two. Um, in this particular case, the whole shower lasted 40 minutes. Uh, it was seen a few, uh, three times before, 1925, 35, and 85. And I had predicted it would come back in 95. And um, not because it, a clump of dust in this case was going around in 10 years, as uh, you, know, you would think, but uh, because uh, the planets, Uranus, uh, planets uh, Jupiter and Saturn were directing the uh, path of this stream of dust particles into the Earth's path um, with a sort of a epicycle motion, you know, 12, 12 years for, for Jupiter and 30 years for Saturn with, and then a little bit of Uranus and Neptune would uh, create a, a, a going around the Earth's path a pattern that, um, um, you know, that directed, that would direct the dust trails in the Earth's path at certain times. And uh, so by simply looking at where the planets were in the sky, you could tell when a meteor shower would return. This is the day of astrology, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and it worked. I mean, we, uh, we were out there in Spain and we observed this event. And um, this is still looking back at, you know, many years of watching meteor showers. This is still a, you know, a high point because it was so unexpected and it was so exciting to, uh, see nothing initially, and then suddenly seeing meteors radiate from the sky. And then at the peak, the shower was five meteors a minute. And many were the brightness of Vega, um, DNAP and so on. So it was uh, quite a noticeable event and it was a, an incredible experience. And I think all the people in this photograph, all members of the Dutch Media Society uh, have fond memories of seeing this, just experiencing this. And so we had a, another return of the shower uh, uh, a little while back, and uh, also that shower uh, returned as, as we expected. So this particular uh, meteor shower was caused by Lone Piet Comet, but we still don't know what comet is causing it. So this comet is still, you know, out there, unknown. It can pass very close to its orbit. It's potentially dangerous, an impact hazard. Uh, but we don't, uh, we know the approximate orbit, but, but we don't know where in the orbit it is. But this is uh, the meteor shower here gives us a, a guide on where to go look. So then uh, we did a bunch of observing campaigns uh, around the Leonid storms of the 1990s. Spectacular uh, missions and fortunately also spectacular displays of meteors. I mean, um, being out there flying uh, for the coast of Greece to see these meteors come down was also just amazing. At the first time, um, I did this, I completely forgot to look out of the airplane window because, uh, you know, <laughs> all these monitors in the plane and we saw plenty of meteors on the monitors, but uh, I just did not look outside. And, you know, I hit my head afterwards that I didn't do that, but um, I got another chance in 2001 and two. And in 2002, I actually got to fly again during, um, during the, the storm and that time I did look out of the window <laughs> and it was nice, it was very nice. So uh, yeah, at that, at that time, a lot of the meteor stream modeling was being developed by a number of uh, meteor astronomers. Um, 
and we for the first time really uh, got a handle on how to calculate the evolution of these streams and so so fundamentally you start with a with a cloud of dust and then some particles you know make a wider orbit other particles make a shorter orbit and then after one return you already have a stream you have um, a period of time that material passes by the earth and then the point where exactly it passes by the earth moves around and so if you look for the long period comet this was comet keys uh, in calculations by Esko Lutin. And Lutin is also an amateur astronomer in Finland who picked up amateur astronomy after his retirement. So I'm telling you, <laughs> you could be, even if you're retired, you could be the next person to uh, make cool uh, additions to uh, our field. Um, Esko calculated these positions, uh, as did Jeremy Rubio and others. And, uh, we found that um, in 2007, we would get a chance to see this meteor stream again, because the stream was then predicted to be at the sort of the same distance from Earth, a little bit inside uh, Earth's orbit. And, uh, and that event was observed also. We got to, to fly uh, aircrafts during that event here from California, and it was very nicely uh, detected. Uh, the stream sort of goes in and out of Earth's orbit of time. As you can see, those are all the plots where the stream is when the Earth is at the node. And you can see that you really have to have those conditions that the stream is at the exact right spot at the exact time. If that's not the case, you won't see anything. Zero, zip. <laughs> it's, the streams are that narrow. And so uh, the trick here is to calculate uh, uh, all the planetary perturbations well enough. It is, this is all gravity. So once you know the orbit of the comet, uh, you basically have a, yeah, uh, you can have a handle on, the, on this part of the, of the evolution. So with long period comets like Keys and the Alpha Monoceratids, this only works well for one revolution. If you go to the second revolution, then uh, the planets already mess up the speeds of the particles so much that when they come back, there's no memory of where Jupiter was originally. And so things get spread out. And uh, after uh, already one orbit, uh, you won't uh, recognize the dust trail anymore. So if you see a dust trail from a long period comet, it's the one revolution dust. So it's dust from the previous time it came by the sun. And in this case, comet Keys was last by the sun um, around zero AD. <laughs> so it's 2000 years ago. Uh, and so we, this dust we are seeing is 2000 years old. So those are important things to know. And so this is, uh, these are graphs from uh, the uh, Leonid uh, returns in, in several years, 1998, 1999. And you can see how this motion of the trails works. It, uh, every year, and this is a helitype comet. So now uh, you can see the one revolution train, but also the two revolution, three revolution, four revolution, and so on. And uh, those are all plotted here as, as ellipses for the, where the dust trail is. And the blue is the Earth's path. And uh, you, if, if the, the stream is in the Earth's path, then you get to see a meteor storm. So we got to see one in uh, 1999, a very spectacular event. So uh, yes, last, last, last uh, uh, August, we had this lovely uh, display of the Perseids. Um, these days, uh, photographic techniques have advanced a lot. You don't need to develop film anymore. You can just take your camera, uh, take uh, exposures, long exposures. The cameras are incredibly sensitive these days. And uh, you can uh, uh, image the stars and, uh, and with it also uh, meteors. And this is a very nice compilation by Ellen Stankiewicz and uh, shows, uh, you know, the 40 or so Perseids he photographed during uh, the night of August 13. And you can see that all the meteors sort of seem to radiate from one point in the sky. That one point in the sky is the radiant, and that point is in the constellation Perseus. That's why we call these the Perseids. Uh, if you have never seen the Perseids, uh, you have no business doing astronomy. <laughs> uh, you know, it's one of the most spectacular things to experience as an amateur astronomer. Um, I started, you know, my first observing nights were during the Perseids, as many others. Uh, many astronomers saw bright fireballs, got, got inspired by that. But meteor showers are just uh, lovely. Perseids are uh, uh, very good in the early morning hours. So if you, uh, if you really want to see the Perseids well, you have, to, you have to be a morning person or, uh, you know, toughen it out and spend the night. 
so uh, yeah, with that, we thought we had a lovely Perseids this year and uh, everybody was happy and uh, you know, the, the public had been um, alerted and many people went out and had a good time. And so the next night, everybody stayed inside, went to bed and had forgotten about this event. We know, we're living in social media times. So the news is passe when it's one day old. But uh, that next day, oh, I, I wanted to show you this one. This is also a lovely picture from that Perseus. This was taken on August 8th uh, from uh, McDonald Observatory by uh, Stefan Hamel. Nice Perseus uh, fireball. Uh, and in this case, uh, together with sprites. So these were short exposures. So you see the stars as points. You see the cloud decks and above it, you see lightning going upwards. And the lightning altitude, so sort of where the lightning is seen, is actually the same altitude as where the meteors are. So this is one of those things that uh, you know you can stumble up as a surprise during a meteor shower. But sometimes the meteor shower itself is surprising. And this, in this case, this happened this year on the night after the peak of the Perseids. Uh, everybody was, uh, as I said, uh, gone to bed and uh, called it a day. And you know that happens. You live up. It's all this anticipation of going to the peak of the shower. And then, uh, uh, and then once it has happened, then people go like, okay, that's that's it, next thing. But in this case, uh, you sh really should have gone out at night afterwards because here in uh, the US, especially from Texas, it was just beautiful, spectacular. Uh, the rates of the Perseids were three times that of the annual Perseids normally at peak. So it was, a, was a, a, an outburst and a, sh a short duration event, just a couple of hours. Uh, that uh, there were a lot more meteors in the sky than normally. Now, this was initially detected in radio forward meteor scatter observation, which is basically a technique where you listen to distant radio stations and the meteors reflect the radio signal. And that way you can count meteors, but you get the total count of all the meteors. And so you don't get a lot of information where the radiant exactly is and what the particle size distribution is and that sort of thing. So you really wanna also see these things with video cameras, with, with optical techniques. And fortunately, in Texas, there was a new network that had just been established, headed by Walt Cooney. Uh, he had made a big effort to get two stations installed. And right at that time, uh, Don Selle and Fred Silway and Joe Brewer had, had joined in and it had become um, a very decent uh, meteor observatory and uh, was getting its first results. And lo and behold, uh, Texas and California were the only two sites in the uh, United States that had good clear weather during that peak. So you, you have to be at the right place on Earth to see this, but you have to also have the weather uh, be clear. Uh, and uh, so you need many places in the world to set up cameras to, uh, to monitor these events effectively. So this shows uh, one of uh, Walt's uh, camera boxes uh, we're using. Uh, this is part of the uh, CAMS network, the Cameras for All Sky Meteor Surveillance. We're using, uh, uh, it, it was built based on analog cameras. Um, at some point we'll pour it over to digital, but these are still the, the analog cameras, uh, NTSC type field of uh, pixel size, um, 640 by 40 pixels and uh, about uh, 30 frames per second, as far as video is concerned. And they, these cameras pick up stars down to about fifth magnitude with a field of view about 20 by 30 degrees. And so you need a lot of cameras to cover the sky. Um, but uh, you know, if you have some, uh, some other amateur astronomers interested in pitching in, uh, you can do that. You can set up many cameras. The cam software is really powerful, you can deal with lots of cameras. Uh, our total network globally now is over 500. So, and this is the coverage of the uh, CAMS Texas network at the time of the outburst event, uh, where each color is a separate station. In this sort of the area that's currently being covered. But, um, you know, hopefully more people uh, uh, add in. I mean, people in Corpus Christi, San Antonio, and El Waco and so on, just set up cameras, expand this area. Uh, the bigger the area is, the more chance you have of a meteorite fall being recorded. And uh, the bigger the area is, the more meteors you get. And you'll see that's really uh, is important. So these are all the tracks that were recorded during that, during that Perseid night. And you can see that all the meteors are moving parallel. And that's because the radiant, the direction from which the meteors are coming, 
uh, is uh, doesn't change that much. It's always northeast. The radiant sits in Perseus, so it sort of rises from the northeast and then makes a big arc going up at, uh, towards the morning. And you can see that uh, if you are sitting there in the middle of it, uh, then uh, all these meteors are around you. So you see meteors behind you, in front of you. Um, they all seem to radiate, seem to move away from this radiant point, the Perseus radiant. So the radiant is really the direction from which the meteors are coming uh, to us. And so this is now the count uh, of how many meteors were, uh, were filmed and triangulated. These are actually, these are real Perseids. We know for each meteor uh, the, the, traje the trajectory and uh, you can count the numbers. And then this shows very nicely the, uh, the detection of that outburst. And so this, uh, Plot was published in uh, in Meteor News and on the put out a seabed telegram that this had happened, and it was also featured in uh, spaceweather.com, for, uh, for example. So Texas is on the map, Camps, Texas. It's really already <laughs> just about uh, you know month in already produced uh, something extraordinary. You guys saw uh, an outburst of Perseus. Now we know the parent body of this thing. Comet Swift at all. Um, but we do not know exactly what is causing this outburst. It's not one of the uh, one revolution, two revolution, three revolution or so dust trails from Comet Swift at all. This comet is big, um, you know, uh, 20 or more kilometers in diameter. And so it's very hard to move by uh, non gravitational forces. And so the, you can predict the orbit back in time uh, very well. And um, we just don't have any dust trail encounters uh, that match this, this sort of time of encounter. Uh, we are suspecting that what we're seeing here is debris that is trapped in mean motion resonances. Um, that's uh, at the moment still sort of, um, you know, a suspicion. Of course, we, saw, we have seen this sort of thing also with the Leonids. I mean, if you remember in 1998, it was this big fireball storm over Europe lots of bright meteors were seen. At that time, um, that's the same sort of phenomenon. Uh, in this case, uh, we're looking at, uh, probably we're looking at particles relatively uh, ejected at relatively high speeds. And uh, that means we, we are seeing mostly faint meteors. So this was especially a remarkable event for people with really good dark clear skies, uh, as people reported in uh, Canada, for example. So what we do is we film the sky. This shows one meteor uh, from a CAMS camera in the constellation, constellation of uh, Gemini. And uh, if we have a second uh, video of it, then we can uh, take these two tracks relative to the stars, use the stars as sort of our background and triangulate it. And so this is one of our boxes in Fremont Peak. We have lots of these cameras set up, triangulate the trajectory and the triangulation then gives you the direction from which the meteor is coming and the velocity. And if you do that uh, with one meteor, you get one point on the star map and say that meteor came from that direction. And if you do that with two meteors, you get another point, three meteors, you get more points. And that's the idea. You want to uh, determine directions from as many meteors as you can. And when we were doing this with photography, a uh, period of time in the, uh, late November, early December, this, is, this was our result. Uh, the net total of, uh, you know, not that many meteors. Um, very difficult to recognize meteor showers in this data. So the white points here are the stars um, and the colored points are the meteors. Uh, there's just not that many of them. And so the early meteor showers that people reported were usually based on small groupings, like you had two or three meteors that came from somewhat similar orbits. And that was then a new meteor shower. So that made the whole literature incredibly opaque and difficult because how do you know how do you deal with that and uh, visual observers were plotting these meteors and they were finding these uh, radiant points from um, multiple meteors seemed to come but you you never there was no triangulation there so you were never certain that that was the radiant point of a given meteor and so that was also that also led to the many reports of showers that just don't do not exist so at some point uh, I realized we had to uh, get some clarity. And that's where the CAMS project came out of. And 
after a bunch of years of observations, uh, this is how the sky looks now. Same sky, <laughs> same period of time in the year, uh, but now, you know, well observed. And so you can see that uh, there are fast meteors that are the, the red ones and the orange ones. Those are coming uh, straight at us. The Earth is, is punching in them. So, you're, so basically the Earth is moving uh, at this time of year uh, to, towards Regulus, towards uh, the lion. And uh, the sun is uh, in Scorpius. And, uh, uh, and it's in the direction of the lion that you get the highest speeds. And of course the Leonids are there, so you get uh, very high speeds for the Leonids. But the Geminids is this big green blob sitting north um, to the north, uh, what is it, up and to the right. Uh, the blue uh, areas are where the blue blobs are the turrets from Komodenki. And so um, each blob is a meteor shower. And you can see that there's lots of blobs in this graph. And there's a lot of detail and structure that, uh, you know, some of it is not yet defined, more observations. And uh, so over the years, we have been adding in points. It's like an impressionist artwork. It, uh, with every point, with every dab, you get a, a little bit better picture of the sky. And uh, over time, this has uh, this is what we've uh, what we've learned. So now you're going through the year, uh, from uh, you know January to December, and every day the sky looks different. And you can see meteor showers uh, pop in; they are active for a little while and then they disappear. And some meteor showers are active for uh, weeks on end. Other meteor showers are only there for a day. Uh, some even for just a few hours or 40 minutes, like with the half Um There's also this really interesting thing in this graph. So you can see the, the red ones uh, are the, it's the epic source, the actual motion of the Earth. Those are mostly Hellion, Heli-type comets, long period comets. And then there's this blue area, which is mostly Jupiter family type comets called the anti-helium source. And uh, those, those are uh, orbits that sort of go to, uh, to Jupiter and then come back, so short orbits. And as you can see from that, anti-helium source, there's a bunch of meteor showers sort of emerging and then make a big arc on the sky. And that was really, uh, uh, you know, when I first saw that, that was really interesting. A lot of uh, meteor shower names were given to these streams because they constantly change the direction for which they're coming. Um, but uh, that's, a that's a common phenomenon. It's associated with short period comets. So it gives these big arcs like the Omicron aerodynamics. And it's caused by showers that are very warped. So if you plot the orbits in space, this is how they look like. They can be active for quite a while, but they are very stratified, they're very young streams that have just dispersed this way. And a, a, a intro, very interesting phenomenon that sort of um, gives us a handle on age and how all these streams are. If you keep putting points on the map and you keep doing that long enough, <laughs> then you start seeing really interesting detail. Like for example, here, a meteor shower called the Alpha Capricornet in July. Um, uh, if some of you are meteor observers and like me in the old days and uh, you're out there in July and you see an Alpha Capricornet, that's just a fantastic experience because these meteors are often bright and they are uh, incredibly flary. They just flash and go while, while uh, on the way down. And so they're beautiful meteors to watch. Um, they come from a comet called 169P Neat, and it's a very interesting comet because it's mostly inactive, but it uh, does has some activity. And there must have been a period in the past that this comet lost a lot more mass, it broke apart or fragmented. And at that time, uh, it's the dust we're seeing is from from that sort of disintegrations. And in this case, you can see there's another shower right next to it which is caused by uh, a fragment of comet uh, NEAT. And we've identified that fragment in one of the, as one of the SOHO comets. So that uh, there's a remaining body there that survived this disintegration. And it's uh, called um, 2003 T12 SOHO. And that object uh, gives this, uh, this other stream. So uh, the breakup of comets is really uh, interesting because a lot of these comets short orbits and are relatively stable orbits, they um, tend to be uh, dormant. So this is, for example, an object uh, 2003 EH1. That's the name of the near object. 
And uh, this one identified as being the parent body of the quadrantic shower. And if you've, again, if you're a hard, hardcore meteor observer, then you've seen the quadrantics. They're very hard to observe for anybody else because you have to go out in January, uh, very early morning. Uh, you can see some meteors from this stream if the weather is clear. And of course, in the Netherlands, where I came from originally, it was never clear. And so, um, so this was a sport to try and observe the stream. And, uh, and it was, uh, you know, just a lovely surprise that uh, at some point all the near object surveys stumbled across this, this one body that, that belongs to it. And this stream is uh, part of a bigger complex called the Mackelt complex of, of objects and streams. Uh, the Mackelt complex includes um, a group of comets called the Mast and Sun Grazers and also a group of comets called the Kreuz Sun Grazers. The Marsden group is associated with the daytime Ariatids and the people who are observed by radio or by uh, a radar uh, are very familiar with that stream. It's a daytime stream. Um, you can see it in the last hour of the night, uh, also sport to try and see that stream. But, um, but all these, uh, these bodies are basically uh, pieces of what, uh, what still is uh, 96P Mackels. And, uh, here, uh, Michael lives in my area, so I had an opportunity to meet him at the San Jose Astronomical Association. Uh, fantastic. Also, a very active observer, observed a lot, uh, discovered a lot of comets, really interesting comets, clearly. So, uh, you know, this could be you. And so, that sort of breaking up of comets uh, creates a lot of mass, a lot of dust being uh, input in the solar system. And uh, at the time, so this is a, a nice picture of uh, uh, the Southern Hemisphere near in Chile, where you can see the Milky Way very nicely, but you can also see the zodiacal light, which is this diffuse glow with Venus there that uh, sits at an angle with the uh, Milky Way. And it sits in the plane of the solar system, in the ecliptic plane. Uh, these are dust particles that scatter sunlight. And um, these dust particles are important because they hit satellites and you know, so you wanna know uh, where they are and how they move. And for that, you need dynamical models. And at that, well, at that point, uh, people were really thinking that a lot of this dust came from asteroids. But um, given that I, I was seeing all these uh, uh, meteor showers from broken comets, I was thinking, no, the source is probably cometary. And that inspired David Nesvoni to really build the first dynamical model of the zodiacal cloud. And it uh, really demonstrated that uh, the uh, meteoroids come from uh, Jupiter family comets mostly because the zodiacal cloud is too thick to explain with asteroidal dust. You really need not just the uh, cometary uh, population to be, uh, you know, have a range in inclinations to be thick, but in addition, you need Jupiter to stir that up and that's what happens with cometary dust because the appealing of comets tends to be close to Jupiter. And so most of the material in the zodiacal cloud, most of the mass comes, comes from Jupiter family comets and then mostly from the disintegration and breakup of, of Jupiter family comets. And so this is really, uh, this, this all came from, uh, thinking came from the sort of the, the work on looking at meteor showers. Uh, this is uh, what CAMS, Currently, uh, how CAMS networks currently distributed in the world. Um, in order to see these meteor outbursts, these unusual meteor showers, you really have to be uh, everywhere and you have to have clear weather at all times, which is hard. So, but we keep pushing for having more cameras set up and, uh, and uh, better monitor uh, the, the skies to see these things. And uh, in 2019, we got a nice expansion in the Southern Hemisphere sponsored by NASA. Um, we set up networks in Chile, uh, in Namibia, in Australia, and we had small networks in, uh, already in New Zealand, which was expanded, and we had a small network in South Africa and uh, effort in Brazil. So in the Southern Hemisphere, we are very nicely um, distributed in longitude. On the Northern Hemisphere, that was not the case yet. So uh, the US um, looks reasonably well, Covered, but uh, uh, as you saw with the Perseids, you know only Texas and California had clear weather, so you really need you really need to have lots of lots of networks active. 
uh, the Europe is doing very well as a big uh, meteor observing community in Europe. Um, we have a network in the Benelux that's CAMS based. There's also unaffiliated networks called Edmund and uh, Equation Meteor Network. And we've started setting up a network in Turkey. And we also have a network in the United Am Arab Emirates. Uh, and at the moment, we are working to try and put our network in India. So that would uh, you know, help cover, cover that part of the globe a little better. There is a network also in Japan called Sonotaco. Uh, Sonotaco first succeeded in doing this, uh, you know, using video cameras and scaling up the, the effort. So they have data starting in 2007. And we started in, uh, in 2010. Uh, they've since uh, sort of uh, stagnated at sort of 25,000 meter orbits per year. Um, CAMS uh, went up like a rocket. We are at the moment uh, around, uh, I don't know, four or 500,000 a year. And it's the biggest network in the world at the moment. But uh, there's other efforts I'll show you later that are catching up and uh, new techniques that, uh, that will uh, surely help to monitor the skies better. So this CAMS, uh, we use the WATEC, uh, mostly the WATEC, uh, WAT 902H2 ultimate cameras. They are the best in terms of sensitivity, stability, and they have uh, lasted us 10 years. So we, these cameras were very enduring. Um, and we used uh, 20 or 16 or 20 of them uh, in, uh, in a station and then have a bunch of stations. This is the long list of meteor showers that we now have. Uh, it's really long. <laughs> so it's uh, this ongoing effort uh, to verify all these streams to make sure which ones do exist and which ones do not. And that's really the goal of CAMS. And so uh, the CAMS software was built by Pete Gurel. Um, he uh, uh, is in uh, Virginia, uh, runs a small network network, the Mid-Atlantic network, and he's incredible. <laughs> he came up with a lot of uh, extraordinary solutions in, in, in getting a good track to the meteor um, observations, to be able to triangulate, to be able to deal with all the various cameras, to do the calibrations of all the camera fields and whatnot. And so uh, that created a bunch of software modules. And then if you want to run those software modules on a PC, then you need some sort of automation. It can be simple, but you can also build in a lot of safeguards. And uh, Dave Samuels, who's now in, the, uh, in uh, Texas, he recently moved from California to Texas. Um, and Steve Rao is in, uh, in the Benelux, uh, have developed some uh, software tools, some scripts to uh, run all these modules and uh, make a PC work uh, reliably during the night. And uh, that's a and and they are they are maintaining uh, the the various uh, stations uh, remotely, and so that's a big job because we have mailboxes all over the world. Just here, are just a few in Namibia, South Africa, the United Arab Emirates, New Zealand, Chile. Um, uh, each is one station. Every network has a bunch of stations, and so um, Dave's um, you know remote uh, contact. Uh, platform numbers are huge. <laughs> so he has to know exactly where to go when, when there are issues. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's grown uh, to uh, over 500 cameras uh, globally. And I'm hoping it will grow more, become a really serious network. So initially up till the end of 2016, uh, we would collect all the observations from the various stations. Uh, they would then be, um, um, analyzed at the SETI Institute in California, where I work. And uh, by doing these triangulations by hand, looking at every solution to say, okay, this is a good one, this is a good one, this is not a good one, and so on. And that really got old. At some point, I had lots of people, volunteers, helping me with this over the years. Um, just collecting the data, just uh, being able to uh, keep up, um, sort everything, uh, calibrate all the cameras, make sure that everything was in good shape. Uh, but that was also not sustainable. I mean, it was just too much work. And so uh, we came in 2017, we came up with a new concept <laughs> um, where, uh, you know, I had to be automated. Clearly, this was not. Uh... And so this is now uh, the CAM system. The CAM system is now fully automated with uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning tools to um, 
process all the data and to do that autonomously. So uh, that PC there in my office is doing all the hard work. All the data from CAMS taxes are uh, sent to a public server. And then from there, this PC grabs the data, uh, then does all the calibration checks, and then um, does all the triangulations. And then uh, when the results are done, uh, all the orbits are compared with a big database of uh, lookup table of orbits seen before and identified before, and that way we uh, identify the meteor showers. And then all the results are uh, put on the web. And so uh, day after the observations, hours after the observations, you can uh, see the results from that night. And that's really cool. So you can keep track of what, uh, what your network observes. You can see what every observer sees. Uh, and you can look for new, new meteor showers. So if, that's not, if it's not in the database, it will be a blob of white points. I'll show you in a minute. So this is uh, here, uh, Luke, as you know, is visiting. He's uh, uh, set up, built, set up, and coordinates and runs uh, CAMS Arkansas around Little Rock, Benton, and uh, Conway. And he's really um, uh, quite an engine behind this. I think that he, he was also a big support for Walt uh, in setting up uh, CAMS Texas, as was Dave Samuels, of course. So uh, yeah, so that, uh, uh, that's how it that's how it looks at the moment. That's how it works, and you can see I'm smiling. So I'm uh, sort of it's still a lot of work to make sure that everything runs properly, but it's doable now. So this is uh, our website, uh, NASA Meteor Shower Portal. that plots each of the radians on a star map. Stars here are black, and the meteors are colored. And this uh, website, uh, you can go there. Uh, I can show you afterwards. Uh, you can go there and it uh, allows you to rotate the globe and, uh, and play with the data. And you can see that uh, another event that CAMS Texas picked up in uh, the first year of observations, or should I say the first months of observations, uh, was this uh, Kappa Cygnet shower. Those are the blue, the blue meteors at the top there. Uh, that meteor shower, we do not know what the pan body is, so we're still looking. Uh, it's a very interesting stream because it only comes back once every seven years. And it has been doing that since 1879. Every, every, once every seven years, this meteor shower is there. And in other years, it is just not. <laughs> it is nothing. <laughs> and uh, so it's clearly a very uh, narrow stream that periodically moves in the Earth's path. And uh, it's very... Uh, interesting because it's one of those showers that, that is warped, that moves, makes a big arc. So it starts uh, low and near the ecliptic plane and then the radiant just moves to the, almost to the ecliptic North Pole. So this year it showed up. Last year, by the way, it also had a, a, a weaker showing. So we were sort of in the middle of the seven year cycle, but, uh, but it was detected. It was very nicely recorded this year. So hopefully this inspires more studies, uh, you know, trying to figure out. We, we at some point uh, in work with uh, Jeremy Vouboyon identified a possible parent body, 2008 ED69, but that's a body that's relatively far away and it's, uh, you know, perturbations by Venus and so on that matter. Um, so we'll see if that ultimately proves to be the real source. So the future um, is bright because uh, uh, there are new cameras uh, that are available. The, Sony IMX291 board camera, especially it's uh, uh, HD and it's uh, you know uh, uh, as, you know four times bigger field of view per camera. Cameras are cheaper, um, and I have been now uh, a few commercial cameras built that you can buy and that uh, you can use to add to the network. So this one, uh, the RMS camera, was developed in Croatia. Uh, and is CAMS compatible? So if you set this one up in a CAMS network, uh, it produces, it can put, you have to direct it, some of the data to SETI. Uh, this is run out of the University of Western Ontario with Dennis Vida, um, but you can direct the data to, uh, to me as well. And then um, they, they can be included in the analysis. And um, they, are, they, are, they are run by uh, Raspberry Pi computers, so they're not quite as reliable as just a regular uh, desktop PC, uh, but uh, you know, work is being done to try and uh, improve that. Also the light curves, are, uh, there's issues with it because they overestimate. So it 
uh, it's not good for magnitude distributions. Uh, but uh, hopefully that issue gets solved as well in the future. So this is uh, this is a new camera, uh, just an overview of one of the nights. If you add up all the detections, so in this case uh, the camera was was aimed too low in the sky. You can see what happens then: the meteor's uh, tracks are getting short, and what that does is it uh, because the meteors are really far from the camera, very far away. And that means that the precision is not so, so good. So if you combine a track that's low in the sky with, with one that's higher up in the sky from a regular CAMS network, then it screws up the result. And so we are now built in a safeguard that, that uh, in our data collection, we only include the tracks from RMS cameras that are higher up than uh, 30 degrees elevation. And that seems to work uh, just fine. So uh, CAMS Benelux has a lot of the RMS cameras set up. They were sort of pioneering uh, that type of camera. And then uh, uh, low cams in, um, in Arizona is now expanding with these. And it's really starting to you know, get, a, get a handle on making, making them a little bit more reliable. And this is another idea inspired by cams, uh, also based on the IMX291 uh, camera, but these cameras are not uh, cams compatible. Uh, but uh, the camera uh, system is designed for looking at fireballs. So they, they, these are deliberately aimed low in the sky. So the idea there is you want to catch big fireballs that give you beach white falls. And um, uh, if at some point, you know, in the future, uh, more work is done on the software, then it should be possible to also get these cameras to be cams compatible. So this, uh, this is a project run by Mike Henke. And this is some of uh, the results that come from his uh, sets of cameras. This is actually the Perseid outburst that we saw uh, uh, on August 14 uh, from one of the stations in Iowa. So uh, last little bit, uh, yes, cams, uh, cameras do pick up Meachwhite Falls. Um, these are rare. Uh, the cams cameras pick up the falls early on, so you get the beginning part of the trajectory very well determined. Uh, but because the cameras don't look below 30 degrees elevation, usually we see the beginning part of the track. So it's very good for getting the orbit in space, the, the initial impact orbit. That's really what we, what we need. Uh, you need additional data like one of my Genki's cameras uh, to uh, basically see where the meteor has its brightest point and then uh, be able to, to calculate where meteors might uh, uh, have landed on the ground. Um, this is a project I did uh, in 2018, and we just published the results. This was a meteorite fall in Botswana. Uh, this was from an uh, object, an asteroid that was seen in space. And this was the second time. The first picture I opened with was asteroid 2008 EC3. This is asteroid 2018 LA. And uh, this asteroid was tracked for eight hours, um, not enough to really get a good grip on where uh, it, it should have impacted. Uh, but we uh, went to commercial uh, video security cameras and uh, used the shadows that we saw in the, in the cameras as a way to uh, uh, get directional information. That way we triangulated the point where the meteor broke up and that was over the central color high game reserve. And uh, as a last uh, item, I'll show you the, um, if, if the video works, let's see if that, Yes, there we are. This is actually in the Central Kalahari Games of the moment a meteorite is found. So this is just to illustrate that there is no, uh, you know, loud uh, jumping in the air or whatever. Um, usually scientific discoveries are made by uh, reactions like, uh, oh, that's funny. And so in this case, <laughs> I happen to have the camcorder in my hand. I was, have been filming all day and I start, just started a new uh, video sequence. And uh, then I, I came across uh, this meteorite. And this, so this is a fragment of asteroid 2018 LA. 
we examined it. It proved to be a, a, an HED, a howardite ukrite diogenide type. And this meteorite, um, these meteorites in general are thought to come from Vesta or its Vesta asteroid family. And we were able to show that it uh, most likely came from uh, the, the impact crater called Rubria on Vesta. So that was a, was a great result. It was just fantastic to experience. So with that, uh, I've ended my talk. Uh, I, um, if I have time, if uh, people uh, uh, allow me to do so, uh, if you want to, I can show you our website that shows the data from the CAMS network. Is there time? How would you Absolutely, how we... please do. All right, so I'm gonna see if I can bring that up just a second. And while you're doing that, I see the picture of your book behind you. Is that, uh, yes. is that it there? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Just one second. Right. And share again the screen. And... can you see the you can see the page? Yes, we can. So uh, this is our project uh, website. You can see the nice results from Campus Texas there right at the top. Uh, if you um, click on the little circle here on the side uh, that says view Campus data, that takes you to a website uh, that uh, is, is, shows the results of our uh, nightly observations. Uh, this was, F it's called FDL because that was the project that sort of automated my brain <laughs> and got this whole, uh, this whole effort going. And so what you're looking at here is an interactive sphere, a celestial sphere that shows the constellations. I don't know if, how familiar people are with the constellations, but here's Orion, constellation of Orion, you see? And here's the Hyades, Pleiades up here. So it really shows the whole sky. You can, it's interactive, so you can move it around. You see here on the side is popping up a yellow uh, circle. That's the direction of, to the sun. So that's where the sun is. And so there's not that many meteors from right on top of the sun, although there was a few, something weird going on there I need to look at. <laughs> All right, so these are the meteors that come from the front of the earth, the apex source, the reds, reds and the oranges, so they're sort of 90 degrees away from the sun, the uh, east. And um, these are the fast meteors. And you can see there is a shower here at uh, 208, September Perseids. Uh, there's a shower here uh, in the south, uh, 337. And then uh, if you, uh, and this, this uh, uh, let's see if this is last night's data. If you go to the calendar here at the top, you can pick any day you like. Uh, I think I'm usually showing the night prior because the, the observations of, the, of last night are very gradually are coming in. So this is actually last night. And so again, you see the, the September Perseids here, uh, New Orionets, it's not a shower here. Uh, these are the, the Ernest Minarets, I think. And then if you turn uh, a, a bit, then this is the anti-Helian source. So these are the blue meteors. And so you see the torrents, the northern southern torrents there. And uh, some showers in the north are still here, uh, something from shower 220. So, um, so yeah, this gives you an overview of what meteor streams there are. But it becomes really cool if you click on one of these points. <laughs> like 208, because that takes you to an, another website. And that actually shows that meteorite, uh, meteorite stream in space. We are in the process of populating the solar system with these meteorite streams. So this is the September Perseids. It's a long period comet. And um, we are uh, seeing the meteors. This is um, uh, Jupiter's orbit, Saturn's orbit, Uranus and Neptune. If I zoom in, all this is also interactive. Then uh, the blue orbit, of course, is the Earth, and Mars, Venus, and Mercury. 
And uh, these meteors are coming at an angle, you see, uh, from sort of the front side. So these are pretty fast meteors coming in there and they're hitting the earth at this point. So when the earth goes around the sun, it's at this point when, uh, when, when, they, get, uh, when they get detected. And it's, uh, you know, it's a fun uh, game to play with um, different dates. For example, if we go to the Perseids, uh, let's go to August 14, the, the night that we were uh, detecting such unusual activity. The Perseids are uh, hard to miss. That's a big orange blob uh, in the epic source up here, number seven, that's the Perseids. Uh, down here, you see the Eta Eridanis, 191. Um, there's some other showers here. Uh, if you want to know the names of the showers, then just look at the table below. It gives each shower a name and and each uh, and the number of meteors observed. And if you click on the, on the green ones, so these are the anti-helium source meteors. So in this case, uh, the southern delta aquariums are, are active and the uh, northern delta aquariums are active. And uh, those are Meckles showers. So from the Meckles family. And they are uh, remarkable because they come very close to the sun and they move in a short orbit. So you can see they go out to about, to about Jupiter so not that high inclined. So they're really uh, Jupiter family comets. Uh, but as you can see, they go a lot uh, further into the inner solar system uh, than the Earth is. They're actually uh, going far inside the orbit of Mercury. So this is, uh, this is a very interesting challenge to, to see. Uh, and uh, here the Kappa Cygnets. This shower, I don't think we have that many in the past, but we'll, we can check. This, ah, this is the Kappa Signet shower. So you can see this is one of these warped showers. I don't know if you can see it, but um, basically also coming out to the orbit of, of Jupiter, so Jupiter family comet. And this one goes to the orbit of uh, Venus, but so the nearest point is the orbit of Venus, just inside of that. And so, yeah, for this one, we don't know what. Uh, don't know the parent body yet. So uh, all of this is, uh, you know, uh, educational. If you're a start, one of these starting uh, astronomers, then uh, then you know this is this is really useful to get a to get a grip on these things. Um, but it's also uh, useful if you go out at night and you want to know what sort of meteor showers are active, because it tells you that where the radians are located, where the active showers are. And you can pick any date you, you have as long as you go back in time because this is a day visualization display. Uh, you can see any, uh, any um, date, date that you want. So you can pick last year's uh, activity. And if there's anything unusual in the sky, you, you may see it earlier. And then finally, um, okay, so CAMS Texas, you can actually select here from among all the networks we have, CAMS Texas and uh, can see the results that are coming uh, from, you know, above your head. These are the meteors that were captured by uh, Walt and his friends. And uh, this is for uh, last night. So he picked up something interesting here. <laughs> I don't know what that is. If it's confirmed by others, you need to, uh, you know, if it's four or five, then it's very hard to, um, so sometimes these clusters are incredibly small, like uh, they're sitting very close together. So you have to be very careful at uh, uh, identifying them. But uh, yeah, this could, for example, be just a, a weak shower that, that popped up briefly uh, seen over Texas. And uh, if you do this, if you select the date, so even if you select uh, last night's date, then there's another table coming under the, uh, the globe. And that uh, table shows you all the observers. So you can see that for each camera, how many meteors were captured. Uh, so Joe Brewer's cameras did very well with 20, 15, 13 meteors each. Uh, Fred's cameras uh, did well. It depends really on your uh, coverage and your overlap with other cameras, how many each camera picks up. But this is a good way to um, see how well your cameras are doing and also um, see you know, if a camera is out there's a problem. Uh, and uh, you know, all the stations, all the stations in the network are uh, reporting. And it shows you the total number of meteors. So last night in Texas, 128 meteors were triangulated. And that's a very decent number. 
uh, with that, that sort of number, you can really detect uh, some of these some of these outbursts. Um, for example, Arizona is now massively expanding. They uh, they got these data last night, and you can see that. Uh, uh, not sure if that might be something that's still here on, on te that we see in the Texas data. But the, the power from all these observations really comes by adding all these points together. But these are all the, the, the meters detected here. And this is some of the RMS cameras that they contribute to. So they're setting up all of Arizona for with these uh, RMS cameras. And because the field of view is four times higher, you typically get four times more meters than uh, you get for a single CAMS camera. The, the sensitivity is about the same. So yeah, the, so the power is really in uh, in this. You can also go to the past. Uh, that's adding up multi-year data, and that brings up a new window. And then you can sort of swap them between back and forth uh, to see what was observed in the past. You see some copy signals we're still seeing. So there. So the more meters you add in, the more detail you get. The more uh, clearly the meter showers stand out. And so that's why it's. Uh, important that we keep adding cameras and uh, in, uh, in, improve the results and get, uh, get, get more uh, surveillance, more uh, observing of these streams. So with that encouragement, please uh, join Walt in this, uh, in this, in this great project. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we will see CAMS Texas expand uh, exponentially in the, com in the coming years. Well, that's wonderful. I think the, the challenge has been set and I uh, appreciate uh, the presentation. That was absolutely fantastic, Dr. Yeniskins. Um, we did have a few questions if you're uh, up for, for a few of those, if that's okay. Can I unshare my uh, screen? Or yes. you wanna, uh, go, go ahead, yeah. Okay, I, I had a question first. You know, the better that, uh, you know, the more data we get, the better we are, you know, being able to predict these uh, meteor showers going forward. I, I just have to ask, and I know this may be a, ridi a ridiculous question. When are we gonna see the next equivalent to the 1833 Leonids? <laughs> well, um, next time that a bunch of dust trails go inside. <laughs> uh, that was quite an event. Um, but, uh, but yes, uh, exceptional meteor showers do happen. They are rare. And uh, when there's a chance that they occur, then uh, you want to be at the right place at the right time. So you want to really uh, travel and go where the best viewing is. So the, meet the people that were trying to observe the Alpha Monocerpids, for example, um, a few years back, uh, they um, uh, you know, might have been disappointed trying to see the shower from the United States because here the radiant is low in the sky and then things get diluted. You, you don't see that high rates. But people that were in the Canary Islands had a fantastic view. That, you know, that was the place to be, radiant high in the sky, mm -hmm. just coming straight down. Uh, that's when the, the shower uh, sh shows us its best. And Wonderful. so uh, some of the things we're keeping an eye on uh, coming up is the um, Tau Hercules, in, uh, uh, that is debris from Comet uh, Shoshman Wachman Tree, um, where the Earth will have an encounter next year. Um, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. It's mm. not so certain that we will actually go through the debris stream. Uh, possible the Earth will just miss it. Mm. Uh, but uh, in that in that sort of a situation, um, you know, I would I would say try and try and uh, improve your chances of seeing it by being certainly place right like <laughs> go to your mom or. Pick some vacation days and, and, and go to where uh, <laughs> certainly that's a good one to note it's on the calendar. It's very exciting to uh, you know anticipate these events and to then actually see it happen. Right, perfect. Okay, and I think Krishna had a question. Uh, Krishna, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Yes, sir. Where do the meteors come from? Do they come from the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt or uh, and what's the difference between a centaur and a meteor? Okay, so um, the meteors you're seeing in the sky uh, originate, some originate in the Oort cloud, some originate in the Kuiper belt. Uh, okay. We generally think that the, uh, the fast ones, the Apexos 
meteors are coming from the Oort clouds, but okay. they come from long period comets and halitide comets. Yeah. Uh, the ones on the on the side there, uh, these are this is stuff from the Kuiper belt. So okay. the the Jupiter family comets are thought to originate in the Kuiper belt, and the centaurs okay. are just um, you know that's how what the comet what Jupiter family comets are called when they are not quite in the grip of Jupiter. I see. So they are on the way to becoming Jupiter family comets. All right. Thank you. All right. And then uh, Chris Morissette, are you still on with us? I am, yes. Hi, Chris. Uh, yeah. The Is it true that all these meteor showers are uh, emanating from the um, debris from comets? For some reason, I had in my head that you would get meteor showers from other debris that was out there from the asteroid belt or something like that. So I'm a little confused. Uh, as we are, as we are all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this has been an ongoing debate in uh, among you know meteor astronomers and people who who study the interplanetary medium. And uh, uh, I think we are now uh, well. Uh, settled on the on the notion that the zodiacal cloud really predominantly is from comets, a, but a small fraction comes from uh, from asteroids. Uh, some primitive asteroids, when they come close to the sun, seem to um, also break apart and generate a lot of debris. Um, in particular, the most interesting case is the Geminids, because uh, Phaeton asteroid Phaeton is thought to be. Uh, an asteroid and not a comet. So it's thought to have originated from uh, the Pallas family, perhaps, uh, as a high inclination asteroid family. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, a primitive, primitive object, meaning fragile and so on, but it's not, um, it's not uh, a comet from the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud. Uh, the Geminids are producing a lot of meteors and there's a lot of mass coming from this stream. And so it's a very interesting case. And uh, I think that inspired um, JAXA to um, design a, a mission to go and visit uh, Python uh, called Destiny Plus. And I'm hoping that mission comes together and I'm hoping they will be able to actually go and visit this, this object because it's really, uh, it it's looks like it, from radar observations, it looks like it, uh, one of these um, top, uh, what is it, spin top, um, uh, shaped asteroid so it's uh, bulging in the equator and um, sort of like a di big diamond and uh, that that uh, shape is um, you know indicative of periodic uh, losing of material by uh, just rotating rapidly um, but uh, you know there may be other ways that these objects can lose mass and so um, so this this is an, this is this is actually fairly rare so there's very few streams that we know that seem to um, to be associated with asteroids. Um, an interesting case is Bennu. So the uh, NASA organized OSIRIS-REx mission. Uh, Bennu, uh, when when we arrived at the asteroid, uh, turned out to eject particles. And uh, the question then, and and the asteroid was selected for one coming very close to its orbit. And so this, so the question then was, uh, does the asteroid uh, actually provide detectable meteors. And that was one of the reasons why we set up a network of cameras in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, but that project is ongoing and uh, we'll, we'll see what comes out of that. Okay, and then Bill Spitzeri, you had a question? I don't know if your audio is working tonight. Probably not, uh, but Bill had asked a question that said, you showed a picture with many meteors where the camera was pointed too low. How long was the exposure time? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know for uh, the exposure times were only a 30th of a second because it's video. Hmm. But uh, these pictures are uh, created by basically uh, plotting the max pixel intensity uh, over a period of time. So I don't know for what period of time they, uh, uh, what period of time they accumulated their detections. Okay. But probably for, um, I would say, hours. Understood. Okay. And then uh, Marlon Sandlin had a question as well. Marlon, are you there? Do you want to come off mute and ask? Oh, he says he can't come off of mute because of background noise. So he said, I thought asteroids were mostly ice. Uh, maybe you meant to say comets. Uh, where did the meteors come from? Cannot come off of mute. Okay. So that was the question. Um, 
Yeah, so the idea, uh, uh, asteroids are sort of uh, rocky or, or even metallic, but, but mm -hmm. basically solid objects. Right. Um, uh, but some can have a bit of water, mineral water in it, and, and so on. But most of the volatile stuff has, has gone from astero asteroids. He didn't um, mention comets, sea comets, comets, though. Yeah, so comets he... are, uh, uh, they contain ice. And the old thinking was that um, comets were predominantly ice, but it, I think that has shifted to thinking that comets are actually predominantly dust and debris and whatnot, and there's the amount of uh, water ice still there. And so when the ice uh, gets, gets heated up, it becomes a vapor and uh, it ex escapes the comet. And, and while doing so, it drags along dust particles. And that's basically the, the way these uh, cometary streams are created. Um, but, and that's what you see when, uh, when the Rosetta visited uh, uh, its comet. Um, you, could, you could see these, uh, these jets sprouting off and whatnot. Uh, but that's not the way comets tend to lose most of the mass. So most of the mass actually goes in disruptions. And we've never seen a comet break up uh, up, up close. And so if, if one could design a cometary mission that actually, you know, breaks up a comet, <laughs> that, would be, that would be very interesting. But uh, you would want to do it in a natural way. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. And uh, last question. I think it's only fitting that we let Walt ask the question. Walt, uh, are you able to come off mute and ask? Yeah, Peter. Uh, um, when you look at the the orbits of the meteor showers, when they're most distant from the sun, there's a lot of scatter. Is that is that real? And the just the as they move away from the comet parent body, or is that also just a result of the limits of accuracy of our data? I think the answer is both, um, because uh, yes, there is a limit to how precisely you can measure the entry speed, and that really determines how wide of an orbit you 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 end up plotting. Um, so again, uh, the, the the images I showed you with with the visual, visualizations, each white point in those planetarium programs was not a computer model. This was actually an observed meteor. This was a a, a point moving on the orbit of an observed meteor, and so. Um, so yeah, so if the precision isn't high, then you get a big scatter uh, towards uh, aphelion. But, um, but there is also a wider range of aphelia because of uh, planetary perturbations that affect the speed of the meteors and also uh, and, uh, the ejection processes. And so meteor streams are expected to be more diffuse uh, uh, near aphelion than they are at perihelion. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Yeniskins. This is a, a wonderful presentation and a great opportunity to see where uh, professional and amateur collaboration really provides and yields uh, really important data. So uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have folks like Walt Cooney and others who are participating in this network in our club. This is actual science that's happening at our observatory uh, in DarkSight. So uh, for anybody who's interested in pursuing this and, and uh, participating in the, uh, the the project, yeah, uh, I just learned that there are more more people joining. So wonderful! Okay, this is the opportunity. <laughs> well, I, I, I like I said, I think the the challenge has been uh, set out in front of us, and and it's uh, an opportunity for us to take the lead on on some of the data collection efforts that are going on here. So again, thank you very much uh, for this. And Walt, I think we're going to call on you for uh, some help in getting additional stations set up so that we can grow Camps Texas into uh, the largest. Uh, participant in this entire project. <laughs> sure. Well, you know, hey, so I've already bought some more cameras and some more uh, equipment so that we can we can do that. And, and I'll mention one other thing, too. Um, you know, it'd certainly be great to get folks from farther out uh, to to expand our horizon outside of where we are in Houston, Columbus, et cetera. Right. Um, but but, you know, um, more stations within the realm that we already are adds a lot of meteors, um, especially, I think, and, and maybe Dr. Yaniskins, you could add a little more uh, info to this, but you know, on a partly cloudy night, um, some stations are always going to be clouded out, and so one station gets a meteor and the others miss it. Having more stations improves your numbers on the cloudy nights as well as the clear yeah, nights. Yeah, it does very, very dramatically so. 
because most of the meteors you're, you're picking up are the, on the faint side, because, the, because those are most. But the problem with faint meteors is that uh, the brightness of the meteor is not the same uh, as seen from the two stations. It really depends on the distance. So how far is the meteor away from you? And so typically um, the most uh, triangulations happen between two stations. Uh, so that's why you pick up the faint, faint meteors. And so if you add stations in a network, uh, you're, you're gonna uh, detect more and more of these faint meteors. And so that really rapidly uh, boosts up the, the yield and the more the better. Yeah, and, and so I'll put in a quick plug. So our stations right now, we have one in Columbus at the dark site, uh, one at Katy at uh, our house there. Uh, Don Selly is out uh, northeast of San Antonio and Canyon right. Lake. And uh, Joel Brewer is in Sealy. And um, uh, Fred Searway is at Magnolia up towards the woodlands. And uh, Don just has two cameras at the moment although I've already given him six more because he wants to expand. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, so, uh, you know, just a couple of cameras can certainly be a, a real help. Perfect. And, and as you mentioned before, Walter, they're inexpensive cameras and uh, it, it's not too difficult to get these systems up and running, correct? It's not. And, and you know, um, I, obviously me and some of the other folks uh, in the CAMPS network, including folks like Dave Samuels and uh, Luke Juno help with that. And, and then ideally, once they're up and running, you, you don't really mess with them. They just they just run. It's all automated. Run. Wonderful. OK, well, there's no excuse for for the rest of us here. So, <laughs> Dr. Yeniskens, again, thank you very much for joining us. And, and uh Good luck and, and continued success with the, the, the project th that you're working on. And uh, hopefully many more of us from the Houston Astronomical Society can contribute to this project. Thank you. All right. All right. And uh, lastly, before we end the meeting tonight, I just wanted to mention, if you can see my screen, that uh, next month's novice meeting is going to be actually at the end of September, because uh, the first Friday of the month when our general meetings occur is on October 1st. So the novice meeting is going to be Thursday, September 30th at 7 and the general meeting is going to be Friday, October 1st at uh, 7 p.m. as well. And uh, the following day is when um, Stephen had mentioned that he's going to have the novice lab over at the dark site. So uh, for those of you uh, who are interested in learning more about the club, you can visit us at astronomyhouston.org. And uh, you can follow us and view uh, other videos at many of these different uh, social media sites as well. And if you have any questions, as always, you can email us at info at astronomyhouston.org. Happy to answer any questions that you may have, whether you're a member or a guest. Always happy to, to help people learn more about astronomy. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Yeniskins, for a wonderful presentation. And we'll see you all soon. Have a great night.